I don't know. It's a good way to put it. You want to walk in the grove? Yeah, but no. Which means, I don't know. The thing I call my mind seems to be kind of like a landlord that doesn't really know its tenants. Come on, just walk. I don't even know what's bugging me. Who's playing that music? That song I say is stuck in my head. Which apartment are they in? Are you worried about <coughs> your book? Oh, there's my book, the war, the laundry, things I said 15 years ago, the environment, my double chin, unanswered mail, what an ass I am, what a dirty house we have, and I've had the song Goodbye Yellow Brick Road playing in my head for days. <laughs> Where do sudden troublesome thoughts come from? What about you? He says. Oh, for me, it's tornadoes, family, all the wood I still need to cut, and then there's this kind of k tail collection of my 25 greatest screw-ups of all time. I replay that one a lot. I say, man, I know I'm still cringing about stuff I said when I was nine. Why is there anxiety about a past we cannot change? The top of my mind has no answer for this. But walking does make me feel better. Movement is key. I wonder why. There's another part of my mind which seems to not know what year it is at all. And I say, I find myself arguing in my head with people I haven't seen in 15 years, or apologizing, or just trying to explain. It's like there's a place in me where it's all still alive. And then a lot of the book is made up of collage and um, old school work, not mine, but old school work. Um, I wanted to write a book about writing that wasn't just writing about, you know, it wasn't like instructions in writing about writing. I wanted to actually activate that back of the mind. So there's what is an image. We talked about that. <coughs> when I was little, I played a certain staring game that seemed to have invented itself. I would hold myself as still as I could, and I'd make my eyes like uh, a toy's eyes that don't move, and I would wait. I would wait for the other things in the room to forget about me and begin to move. My mood seemed to have a, to have a lot to do with it. I'd have to make myself very calm and very friendly, the way I would when I wanted a shy animal to come to me. And I knew I had to be patient and willing to wait for a very long time. We lived in a trailer then, and any pictures we had um, up were taped to the walls. Sometimes they fell, but this is not what I mean when I say they could move. Mm -hmm. I believe there was another world that would show itself to me in the smallest ways. The gray kitten in the picture by my bed would accidentally blink his eyes. The girl in the picture would breathe. I believed there was another world, but I only noticed it when it became harder to get to. There had been a time when a toy elephant was as alive as a real rabbit in the grass. I didn't know there were different kinds of aliveness in two worlds contained by each other. Something can only become an illusion after disillusionment. disillusionment. Before that, it's something real. What caused the disillusionment? No one told me that the print on the wall was just ink and paper and had no life of its own. At some point, the cat stopped blinking, and I stopped thinking it could. But my memory of the blinking cat is still vivid nearly 50 years later. Why? Why would an image of something which never happened travel with me for all these years? When images come to us, where do they come from? Why do they exist? I believe they are the soul's immune system and transit system. <coughs> what is the past? Where is it located? Is it everywhere, nowhere, somewhere, anywhere, elsewhere, here? What is, where is your imagination? Then when we imagine things we don't want to imagine, why can't we stop ourselves? What is a memory? When an unexpected memory comes calling, who answers? Oops, let me go back. <coughs> Imaginary enemies are not hard to conjure into being. Adults are especially good at it, able to create them and unite against them for ages. The friends are harder to come by. Singular and elusive, they do not appear for others and they do not stay. Mine didn't. The memory stayed, but once I knew the blinking cat could not really blink, which is paper and ink, I never saw my friend again. Not in the outside world, anyway. But paper and ink have conjuring abilities of their own. Arrangements of lines and shapes of letters and words on a series of pages make a world we can dwell and travel in. I traveled up the mountain as Heidi. I slept on a straw bed in the hayloft and heard the high wind in the trees. And I despaired for my future there, not knowing what was to come. 
I remember it like it happened to me. I suppose you could say that it did. There are certain children who are told they are too sensitive, and there are certain adults who believe sensitivity is a problem that can be fixed in the way crooked teeth can be fixed and made straight. And when these two come together, you get a fairy tale, a kind of story with hopelessness in it. I believe there is something in these old stories that does what singing does to words. They have transformational capabilities in the way melody can transform mood. They can't transform your actual situation, but they can transform your experience of it. We don't create a fantasy world to escape reality. We create it in order to be able to stay. I believe we've always done this, <coughs> used images to stand and understand what would otherwise be intolerable. It seems that human beings everywhere understand that a child who is never allowed to play will eventually go mad. But how do we know this? And why do we know this? And what happens when we forget? What happens when we read a story? What's the story made of? Where is a story before it becomes words? Where is a story after it becomes words? What is playing? Though I knew she didn't exist, the monster I was most afraid of was the Gorgon. I hated the thought of her, but she was often on my mind. I made plans for how to defend myself from her. I'd scare myself with the thought of seeing her behind me in the mirror, of accidentally looking at her face. And there's my mom. Why do you draw ugly faces? You just waste paper. She paralyzes you, and you have to cut off her head without looking at her face. And sometimes I manage, and other times she got me. I practiced being paralyzed and turning into stone. Sometimes I did this in front of my mother to see if she would notice. <laughs> Sometimes I turned into stone in the front yard. Once I made myself fall off my bike as if I had seen her while coasting down my street, trying to freeze myself exactly as I fell. I believe a lot of kids play with monsters in this way, that most of us had a certain something that really scared us and seemed to have it in for us, a something we had to defend ourselves against in secret ways. I never talked about the Gorgon. <coughs> I didn't know she was mythical and ancient and also called Medusa, or that she had a history and relatives and she never looked into mirrors. I only knew her from a monster movie I saw one Saturday afternoon when I was about eight, but it was all that I needed. I sat through the Gorgon twice, because the first time she got her head cut off, I looked away and I realized it was something I needed to see, something I needed to know how to do. <laughs> that I had a very Gorgon-like mother never occurred to me. <laughs> And if it had, I would have been lost. Did the Gorgon help me love my mother? I think she helped me very, very much. We never need certain monsters more than when we are children. And a furious woman with terrifying eyes and snakes for hair was the perfect monster for me. What was yours? I started to copy pictures from storybooks and thought it would be a good idea to make my own. I stole paper from school and I made little booklets, but it always seemed I would ruin them somehow. My handwriting looked bad to me, and sometimes I could draw, and sometimes I couldn't, and I didn't know why. Sometimes all I did was erase until the paper tore. Around this time, there were art contests and story writing contests at school, and certain people began to stand out. There's the teacher. And Gary is our artist of this week for his drawing of our school. Sometimes my pictures were pinned to the bulletin board, and when that happened, I always felt very hopeful about my life. And our runner-up is Linda for her drawing of a volcano. The lava was the hardest part because I had to blend. <laughs> Thank you. There's a lady jumping in to save the village. Yes. Sit that back down, please. <laughs> there were ads in the backs of magazines that asked, do you have hidden artistic talent? And I secretly thought I might. I was only about 10, but I wanted to find something good hidden inside of me that experts could detect, something I could show my mom. Draw the pirate, or the leprechaun, or the lumberjack, or the deer. Free. It's free. The first